What's up everyone? My name is Mark. You may know me better as Heist from either Con Gaming's videos or from the Railroads Online Discord. But I wanted to start a new series talking about Railroads Online and doing a playthrough as a developer and seeing what you guys think of it. So, a uh, little background, I am the developer that developed the soundtrack for the video game. I played all the instruments and recorded it and all that fun stuff. Uh, and as well, uh, I provide a lot of feedback on the locomotives and how they handle and how trains handle in the game because I've operated the real thing at the Colorado Railroad Museum. So I have a fresh save loaded up. I haven't even done anything. I just booted up the map and I wanted to show you guys how I play the game and how I connect industries and lay track and, and do a little bit of Q&A along the way. So. Let's get started with getting the right of way cleared out and then uh, we'll get some track laid. All right, so first thing, once you get the right of way cleared a little bit, so you need to figure out where you wanna build your railroad. And for me, what makes sense first move is we need to go to the logging camp because that's what we have as far as rolling stock to pick up first. But at the same time, you can sell logs to the sawmill or you can sell them to the freight depot. And if you sell them to the sawmill, you also get new commodities to haul. So it makes sense to run from the freight depot to the sawmill and then to the logging camp. And to do that in a way that makes sense, we need to know our boundary conditions. So if you see on the map, you can see where elevation changes happen and you can see where it's pretty flat. So we kind of know the route that we need to take to get to the sawmill without running into too many hills, more or less. So we're gonna try and shoot along the edge all the way up to the sawmill and then do a left hand 90 degree turn to go towards the logging camp. And we're gonna try and get up the hill as lightly as possible. I like to make sure that my track is always on a grade. That way there's no collision from the groundwork or anything like that. So I'm just gonna do a little short piece of quarter percent just to get off the ground and I'm gonna go back to zero and straight right after that. And I personally like to lay my grade first before I lay the track or even clear the trees. That way I'm not cutting down a bunch of trees that I don't really need to. And so if we look on the map ahead, we can see that we're coming straight up at a bit of a mountain and you can see the terrain is starting to slope off a little bit. So I'm gonna disengage the angle snap with left alt and start curving my track. I personally don't use the uh, locked to angle curve setting too often unless I'm in a really sharp spot or it's got to be really precise. If I'm just out in the open, I just try to lay something nice and smooth and watching how much of an input I'm making so that, um, so that the curve is consistent throughout. And I do that knowing that um, I lay the grade and the grade's just kind of the rough guess of, okay. Well, this is more or less where we're gonna go and we've got enough space on top of it to let the track wander a little bit. Um, I don't like my track perfectly centered in my grade all the time. Uh, cause, you know, a lot of these narrow gauge railroads really would have just done what they could. So if it wiggles back and forth a little bit, it's, uh, it feels a little bit more authentic to me. And I could see we're coming up to the edge of the hill here again. So we're gonna just curve it gently see if we can sneak through this gap here. And I'm trying to keep it looking somewhat realistic without a huge piles of fill, but at the same time, I want things to be on the grade, so. All right, so this is where we kind of want to make a decision. I'm going to confirm this spline so it builds all the way. We have to make a decision of if we kind of want to hug the hill or if we want to just build off in the woods over here. You can see ahead of us that there's a little bit of a bump, so I think I'm gonna be a bit more prone to hugging the hill this time. So I think what I'm gonna do is demolish the groundwork and get. Oh, we're gonna hug a little closer than that. So one of the big things for laying track that helps to make things nice and smooth is um, when you're actually laying curves or more complex pieces of groundwork or track uh, is just to try and make sure you're moving over and up the same amount. Um, if I'm I'm holding W for so long and then D for so long to make a right hand curve, that kind of thing, so that you don't end up with anything that's too varied from anything else. That way you can build a curve pretty easily. 
All right, it's looking like we're gonna have to do a bit of a trestle here if we wanna make it look nice. Now for trestles, sometimes it's easier just to cut down the trees first just to get a better bearing on where they need to go, but if you're the artist, try and just do what you can. See what works for you. All right, while I'm cutting down trees, I think we'll start doing a little Q&A. So I went through and peered through a bunch of comments on different YouTube videos and came up with a list of questions that you guys have been asking that uh, you haven't seen answers to. Uh, first things first, will you add a Lima Shea to the game? Yes, actually. If you join our official Railroads Online Discord, you can see pictures and updates about things like this. We actually have a Shea-type locomotive that is in progress. And here's a picture of that. All right, so I got all those trees cut down. So what I'm gonna do is first I'm gonna build a fill so that I know where my end point's gonna be. And and we could just leave this as is, but um, I don't want it to be a, just a giant pile of fill. I think it'll look prettier if it's a bridge. So I now know where my end point's gonna be and I'll delete the middle sections and we'll do a, a little ditch crosser trestle kind of the industry term for it. So we'll build one of these. Let's see, the next question in the Q&A is uh, related to the first, what about different tiers and sizes for Shea locomotives? And this is a great time for me to bring up our uh, prospective locomotive tech tree. So on the Discord, we have a tech tree where we've planned out, I believe it's 87 different locomotives that we want to include in the game. Uh, and yes, there are multiple different sizes and configurations of the geared locomotives, not just the Shays, but also Climaxes and Heislers. So uh, more will be coming than what we already have. Okay, so I know, I know how the tracks need to align at the sawmill. And we either need to come in from the, uh, the southwest side and turn right to meet the logging pond, or we need to go past the sawmill a bit just aiming straight north and then doing a 180 around. And I think that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to start swinging the groundwork a little bit to the right here. And this is just roughing it out. I might need to adjust exactly how things line out um, once we get things placed and see how it is. Because we might be a little too close. Um, I'm not sure. And that's kind of the fun of it, uh, is trying to figure out exactly how your railroad needs to end up. So... Yeah, I think this is actually looking like it's gonna work pretty well. Oh, we've got a little bit of bumpy terrain right here through there, here though. So the sawmill is just a smidge higher. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna back up and we're going to raise the roof a little bit. We want a variable grade groundwork for this, not a constant grade. Uh, variable grade means that we can change the grade per section of spline whereas a constant grade applies to the entire spline, not just the individual segments. And I just wanted to lay a little piece, about a half percent grade, so I don't really have to worry about it. All right, so now we will try and bring this around in as smooth but sharp of a 180 degree curve as we can. Although I guess we'll just do a 90. We're further away from the sawmill than I thought we would be. That's all right, this will give us a really good spot to add a switch. And then we'll r roll this around. So I think what we'll do is I'll get the track laid past the log pond, or the groundwork laid past the log pond. We'll go clear out all the trees and then see where it goes from there. So um, I like to overlap my groundwork right up against the edge of the wooden boards at the log pond. That way I know that the logs are gonna roll in no, uh, with no issues. So we'll do that. And then this will be our run off to the logging camp. So we'll get that set up in a second here. But we're gonna go back to cutting trees land. And as we do, we might find some groundwork that looks a little silly. Uh, that's a little too sharp or something that we might have to fix. So uh, we'll do that all in good time, but we'll continue talking Q and A while we're on the way there. So will you add an 060 to the game? We actually have a number of different 060s in progress right now. Again, uh, if you were a part of our official Railroads Online Discord, you could have already seen these. 
in the modeling discussion and modeling showcase channels. But yes, we have Porter Type C, which is uh, made by the manufacturer of the Porter that we have in game, the 040 version. That's a Type B. The Type C is the 060 version. We have a number of different variants of that in progress. And as well, we also have the Bell's Gap Railroad 060 in progress. And that's a neat, funky little 060. So we got a couple different ones. Um, and there may be a couple more on the tech tree. I can't remember off the top of my head, but make sure you guys go check that out and you'll be able to see all that. Will you be able to set roots with the horn? Okay. Well, not necessarily. I don't know if this is something that we would consider adding. Um, just because with multiplayer, it would get really confusing, I think. So we won't see that feature in the game. What about the pointsman house or, or interlocking towers or mechanical interlockings? So uh, myself, I'm conflicted on this one. Uh, you know, I'm a member of a team. Uh, I'm not, I don't get the full say, but I would love to have some amount of this in the game, but that's because my day job is actually as a signal engineer for a transit authority. So um, I deal with interlockings and switches and route locking and all that kind of fun stuff uh, on the day to day. So I think it would be really cool and interesting to have mechanical interlockings. Uh, that said, it's not really prototypical for the narrow gauge and the prototypes we've chosen. Um, it's kind of a thing that maybe we would add it if it makes sense for multiplayer, uh, if it makes you know life a lot easier for players on big servers. So um, that's not quite settled yet, I don't think, but uh, we'll see. What about character customization possibilities? Yeah, so right now everyone's got the default conductor who looks like he's been through some challenging times in his life, as it were. <laughs> and uh, everyone's got the same character model. And that was just a character model that looked appropriate that we could grab from the Unreal Store just to get the game going. Um, so we do plan to have, you know, like guys with overalls and different customizations at some point down the road. Um, it's just not a huge priority for us right now because, you know, we're trying to get the core functionality of the game in a really good spot that's really robust and behaves the way we want it to. So, more coming on that. Please stay tuned. What about a gear system within the track or rack railroads? Um, we haven't really talked about rack railroads, I don't think. And obviously, they would have been prototypical, um... Except in the United States, they weren't really a part of the general system, even in narrow gauge territory. So, it, like, you wouldn't have a transition from a, a regular railroad to a rack railroad uh, in the U.S. So, it would be its own separate kind of thing. I know some railroads in Europe had rack railroads where the locomotives had both powered driving wheels and a separate engine to run rack railroads, like specifically in Switzerland, so that they could climb short you know short steep grades and then keep on going um so i don't know i don't think it would necessarily fit within exactly what we've got to start with the game so i don't think we'll see that but um it's not something that we've really ruled out either i don't think so or at least i haven't heard discussion on it but it's a neat idea <laughs> Okay, so this is a this is a funny one. This is a response to somebody on uh, one of Khan's videos heard me pick up on talking about locomotive personalities, and uh, <laughs> it's a a running joke in the industry. I mean, we always joke that you know the locomotives are like people and they have personalities. I mean, of course they're machines, and you know it's not really a thing, but. Uh, the way they behave sometimes, you'd really believe that they could talk to each other and and, <laughs> and teach each other tricks, as it were. Um, so there was a, a hilarious time uh, in 2014 when I worked for the Railroad Museum in Golden where we were getting the 491 put back in service, which is a Denver and Rio Grande Western K37, um, which is on the tech tree, by the way. Um, and it you know, it was getting steamed up and fired up and running for the first time. And uh, we had old, you know, rebuilt safety valves from the Rio Grande installed on it. But, you know, they weren't in the best shape so that they would kind of leak when you got close to full pressure. So if the safety valve was supposed to open at 200 PSI, um, 
it would start to leak a little steam out at, you know, 195 or whatever. Um, and it's called feathering. You know, they start to hiss, and, it, and that, that's just the term for it. And uh, 491 did it the first time we steamed her up. And 346 had never done it. 346, one of our other operating engines, uh, she had never had issues with her safeties doing anything like that. They were uh, re like brand new valves from the Strasburg Railroad like seven years prior. So they were really were not supposed to have any issues. Uh, and then the first time we steamed her up, at 346 up after 491 had done that, she did it too. And it was just like, what have you guys been talking about? What else have you taught each other? Um, so more on that, uh, that sort of stuff in a minute. Right now we're talking about laying track. So as you can see, that I just laid a pretty straight track without the angle snap on. And you, you just kind of want to aim yourself in the right direction and just hold W and, and just keep laying the track. Um, there's a couple other good techniques where sometimes you want to look backwards at where your track is so you can see how long the spline is. Um, but if you're just running straight track, you can just hold W and shift and just run ahead with it. So what I did this time is I stopped the straight track right before the start of this curve. And I gave it, I gave myself about a little chunk of straight section before it so I can get a full piece in before I start the curve. And now what I'm going to try to do is run and run the same distance and make sure I'm using full length splines and try to curve my mouse just the same amount every time so that I end up with a pretty uniform curve. And that's what I did when I was laying the grade, so I should be able to do it, this too. So uh, hopefully this will come out as a pretty nice sweeping curve without using the angle snap tool. And I find that this is a pretty nice way to lay curves that have um, a spiral to them. So they're compound, they're not just a circular curve like the angle tool. You, you know, the curve eases in and you ease in and then it gets sharper, it finds its compound at radius and then it holds it and then as you exit you start to ease out and you can certainly do that with the angle snap tool um, it's just you know sometimes it's easier rather than figuring out what the degree of curve needs to be to just kind of lay the track and make it happen so that's kind of my preferred method for laying track and you know sometimes it ends up a little wonky but you can always go back and fix it um, with the current way that track lays um, it always feels like it's a first draft on the first attempt. So uh, that said, we do have overhauls for how track lay or how track laying happens in mind. Um, we do want to make sure that we have spline interpolation so that when you connect to an existing piece of track, you can't do that, where it will curve like it was, you know, laid along with that spline. So. Um, those are things that we have in plan so that things get a little easier. And we also want to make sure that the, the radius tool actually works properly. Because right now, um, you could, like I'll give an example. If I set a curve and I set it to, let's call it a 20 degree radius, and I lay a piece this short versus a full length, the sharpness is quite different. So um, we want to make sure that it behaves the same way so that you're getting a 20 degree curve no matter what, uh, you know, no matter how you're laying the track. So um, I know that we have tracks over to the right that we're going to have to mate up with. So I think what we're going to do is we're actually going to change this a little bit. Yeah, the curve, uh, it's not great. We might be able to live with it though. We'll see. I'm gonna delete one more piece of track here. And I'm trying to plan for operations right now. So if we think about it, we're gonna have to bring logs to the log pond from the logging camp and then run the train back to the logging camp, back and forth for a lot of our work. So we wanna be able to turn the train around really easily after leaving the logging camp. Um, but at the same time, we're gonna have to pick up stuff from the sawmill from across the way. So we're gonna to wanna to be able to take loads out of there and they don't have to go to the logging camp. So we're gonna want a tr uh, switch here that allows us to go pick up loads, but also probably a switch to do a reverse loop back coming this way. So I think I'm gonna do put this switch here and I'm gonna have the switch stand be on the outside of the switch. 
because that'll give you best visibility as you're coming around the curve, even if the trees aren't there, because line of sight wise, you'll hit it first. So as you're coming around a curve or something, you'll see that before you'd see a switch stand on the right. So we'll do that. Uh, we're gonna give some space between the switches before we place the second one down. And we're gonna do the same thing for visibility coming from the log pond to have it there. So you don't want the switches to be right up against each other because as you saw, if you watched one, <laughs> as you saw, if you watched the first video I did with Con Gaming, um, if you have switches right next to each other, it's really easy to throw them underneath your train and have your train get thrown off the tracks. So I recommend you don't do that. Okay, well that doesn't look half bad. It's not great, but I think we can run with it. Um, a note on laying track to fixed objects like switches and uh, curves and stuff. I always recommend laying towards the fixed thing rather than trying to leave it. So like place your switch and then try to meet the switch rather than lead off from the switch. It, it feels like the track gets a little smoother um, if I do that as opposed to the other way, but that's just kind of how I lay the railroad, so it might be a little different for you. Okay, and so now I'm leading off from a switch and I want to continue a pretty sharp curve. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pre-kick the track over a little bit because I know that the first segment has got to be in a sharp curve and then it'll end up being closer to straight on the back end. And that doesn't look, that's not spectacular. But that's kind of why I prefer to try and lay to the obstruction as opposed to lay from it. So this is laying track from a switch and trying to pre-kick it to line it up. And it still is a little bit of a kink right there. So let's get rid of that. And now let's try laying to the switch and matching the angle from a piece of straight track that's over here. Give enough space to start a straight from the log pond. And then we'll start laying our curve. And we need to know that we gotta come in and match that angle pretty nicely. And I try to avoid super short pieces of track, but I think a couple ties worth is probably okay. Mm. Yeah, I could have gone a little bit further over on that one piece of track, but this will probably work. It's not the prettiest track work, but I'm trying to show you guys that it's pretty easy to get track that works laid down in the game if you know these couple tips. And I'd like to lay the log pond track really close to the log pond, just like that. Okay, so that's track to the log pond. It's pretty exciting stuff. Next, we're gonna have to figure out how to get to the logging camp itself. Okay. So let's think about where we are and where we need to go. So this is the end of our log pond track. And we look, the logging camp's pretty much dead ahead of us, which is nice, but you can see that there's a little bit of ground changes that are kind of around us here. And we can even see them right here. There's a little bit of a hill here, a little bit of a hill there, but it looks like we can shoot a gap a little bit. So I think we're gonna do that. We're gonna grab a variable grade and we're gonna just run this out and I think I'm gonna try and hug this inside hill here. I think that's the biggest thing that I can do to try and help you guys uh, survey and lay your grades first is try and smoothly hug the inside of a hill. Like you can see that this hill is sloping down like this. So, you know, I was running the track pretty much like this to, or the running the grade to get there but in order to make sure that I don't have to start my hill yet, I'm gonna go just a little bit to the left and we're just gonna have the right side of my grade kind of hug the hill. And now I know that I can keep running across this flat here pretty easily. And so we've done about a 90 degree turn, but um, what I'm trying to do is trying to hug the boundaries of this area. Cause you can see that right above the word camp, there's a bit of a, a hill there. So we're trying to shoot that gap to make sure that we're using as shallow of a grade as possible because we're gonna be running this thing with the porter, which is all the motive power we got to start with. And the porter is not exactly gutsy. So it's just Betsy. 
So we're gonna try and do a shoot for a percent or less. And this grade might be wandering a little too much. I don't know. We'll see. It might be time to start climbing. Yeah, I think I'm gonna bump it up. I think we'll, do, we'll try a three quarter percent. Why not? Eh, no, we need to start climbing earlier than that. So one thing that I have noticed um, that helps me lay my track the best is actually trying to lay from the top of a hill as opposed to the bottom of the hill. So I'm gonna run to the logging camp and then uh, start laying from the top of the hill and try and meet up with that track that I just laid down or meet up with that groundwork that I just laid down. Okay, so I've made it to the logging camp and this is where a log loading happens and then cordwood is over on the other side. So we know that we're gonna have to have a track here. So I'm gonna build some groundwork about where the track needs to be. And I'm gonna start with it kind of steep just to get off the ground a little bit. And then have it pretty close to the platform. And then this, this should about work. This will be our little start here. And now I can get rid of that little steep piece that I started with. Okay, so I'm gonna grab a variable grade and what we're gonna try and do is we're gonna try and hug the mountains the best we can, shooting that gap that we we're looking for with about, I'm gonna try and aim for a half percent down. And this is gonna be a little bit more of a fill than we did earlier, but we're also doing a bit of an elevation change and this is something that the railroad would have had to have done just to meet that grade that they wanna hit, so. We're trying to shoot the little gap. Helps if I aim at it. We're trying to shoot this gap here. You can see that the peak of that hill's there. There's a valley there, and then there's another hill over there. So we're trying to turn the railroad towards the inside of this hill, and we're gonna try and hug this hill on the way down to the best of our ability, at least. We're not quite low enough to really hug it all the way, but it won't look too bad when we're all said and done there. We'll curve here, and we're coming up, it looks like, on the mountains over there, so. This is a, that's a big fill section. Maybe it'd look a little nicer as a bridge, but we'll see. We'll see what it looks like after we clear out the, uh, all the trees and all that, so. And we're, we're not really worried about exactly how sharp things are right now. Like that curve might end up being wicked sharp, but um, I've laid at uh, just a half percent down so that I know that I can pretty easily lay a shallower or steeper section as I need to without affecting how much I can pull that much if I've got to, you know, broaden a corner a little bit, so. Not too worried about that. But now we're just hugging the inside of this curve here, inside of this hill. And we're getting pretty close to where our other groundwork was left. So now we kind of want to try and guide them towards each other. Just got to start seeing it through the trees. And this is where, uh, yeah, survey markers would be a a handy thing right about now, wouldn't they? We've talked about those. No, uh, no confirmed plans, but hopefully we can see something like that. I'm starting to wonder if I wandered too far off into the woods over here. Let me see. I should have put a bridge or something obvious at the end of that other piece of groundwork. I think it was Oh, well, that's why. That's the end of it right here. I was never going to find that. <laughs> okay. So I was laying my track down, and I realized that I didn't end my groundwork where I thought I did. And subsequently, I couldn't find it. So I ran back to the first set of groundwork, and now I'm going to aim this vaguely at the other one that we laid. 
and we'll see if we can mate them up. And I have a feeling that we might end up with a great mismatch. We'll see. And in that case, we'll have to either start the grade sooner, or we'll have to make it steeper. But now, yes, here it is. Okay, so, <laughs> that's quite a bit of a grade difference. <laughs> okay, so the nice thing is though, now we have a continuous path between the two places. So what we can do, and I think it's just gonna have to be a little steeper, unless I wanna run super long down that way, which I don't feel like it. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change the grade to three quarter percent, because this looks like a lot of height, but over the amount of like distance that we're running, it's not that much. I think I'm gonna set, actually, I'm gonna set a constant grade down from here and we're gonna set it down at a three quarter percent. And we're just gonna lay this grade over the top of the one that I just laid, and we'll see where it meshes up. And one cool thing about this technique is you can you can kind of see where the linking point O needs to be unless you blow yourself up in it. Oops. <laughs> All right, let's try that again. One neat thing about the constant technique like this, using the constant grade, is that you can change the grade and it'll change every spline, so you now, or every segment of the spline, so you can change the grade to something steeper and see what grade you would actually meet at. So if we go down to, you know, a three and a quarter percent grade, we'll meet right here, but we don't want it to be that steep, so we're just gonna keep, keep on trucking like this. And, that, and we know that we are having a tough time sticking through the weeds on this hill anyways. So we're just gonna, we know that we're gonna get a little bit more cushion on this, so. So we keep trucking along through here. Like you can start to see the grades now clipping through me, which is inconvenient for seeing where the heck I'm going. So I'm gonna change to going backwards. And we can see that how the grade's placing and yeah, well, you eventually get there, right? Even at such a shallow grade percentage. But you can see if I even just change it a quarter percent, I mean, we're already there at a percent. So I'm gonna see if I can't do it at uh, three quarter though. Cause that would be cool to do sub 1% to the logging camp. I've never done that before. Although it sounds like the sawmill's right behind me, so I don't know if we're gonna get it. Oh, we just might. Ooh. Ooh. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, that's awesome. Okay. So let's clear the trees out and then we'll get the uh, the rails placed down. And we see if we can't uh, get some trains running. Okay, so I'm gonna try and answer this question for the 15th time in this video. I keep interrupting myself with more important things to talk about. Air brakes on cars. So yes, we're gonna add air brakes to more than just the locomotives at some point. And we're gonna start with straight air on the cars. So straight air is the industry term for when you apply the brake valve or when you open the valve, it sends air pressure to the brake cylinders and the brakes come on. So what that means is no air pressure, no brakes. Yes, air pressure, brakes, which Sounds simple, but um, most people realize that modern trains have a different system where uh, if you lose the pressure, the brakes come on with a lot of asterisks on that, but um, we can get into the more nuanced things of air brakes at another time. But that's uh, straight air is what the locomotives in the game, other than the porters, have right now, where you have to have air pressure. Oh, the trees always make me giggle. Uh, <laughs> you have to have uh, your compressor storing air into the main reservoir to be able to apply the brakes. You know, they'll spawn in and they won't stop unless you turn the compressor on, right? So it'll be the same thing with the train cars in addition at some point where you can link the air hoses between all the cars and your locomotive and you can apply the straight air to the train as well. So you get more than just a locomotive's worth of brake, which will be great because if you've played with the new beta branch that I'm playing on, 
you'll notice that things are a little bit heavier and it takes a lot longer to stop when you're just trying to stop with just the brake valve on a locomotive, which is accurate to the real thing. We'll also eventually have automatic air brakes, which, uh, of which there will be a number of different types, um, probably starting with A1 with the G6 independent valve, or excuse me, G6 automatic valve, um, which is what some of the earlier locomotives had. But automatic air is where you supply, <clears throat> excuse me, automatic air is where you supply air to the train and you quote unquote charge the train. So you supply it with air for a while, which fills little reservoirs on each car, smaller than the main reservoir. And then once everything gets charged up all the way, there's a, basically a comparison valve that looks at the pipe that runs all the way down the train called the brake pipe. And it looks at the car's reservoir and it says, okay, well, who's got more pressure? If the pressure is the same, nothing's going on. If the brake pipe has less pressure than the actual cylinder on the car or the reservoir on the car rather, then the difference is applied to the brake cylinder. So if you have 90 PSI in the uh, reservoir and 90 PSI in the brake pipe, you have nothing brakes are released you're happy if you have 85 in the brake pipe and 90 in the reservoir five psi worth of air you know with volume differences in there as well gets applied to the brake cylinders so that is why when you lose air pressure you know you, the cars come uncoupled and you break the pipe the brake pipe goes to zero and then all of the air pressure that's in those reservoirs goes to the brake cylinders. And that's automatic air in a very, very, very basic nutshell. Um, there's a lot more nuance to that and I'm sure if any railroad engineers watch this, they'll, they'll know what I'm getting at. But uh, we'll talk about that more down the road when it gets closer, but we will ultimately have that because a lot of the locomotives that we're gonna be adding in the game uh, down the road had that. And speaking of locomotives that we're going to be adding to the game, I always giggle every time I see this. Uh, no, we are not adding the Union Pacific Big Boy. I, I think that is the thing that we see the most is people requesting the Big Boy. And it makes sense. It's a, it's a huge, cool locomotive with a lot of notoriety. And, and I understand why it comes up. But um, we chose the three-foot narrow gauge prototype in the U.S. for a reason. Uh, because it's kind of underrepresented. And it would be able to be... It was something that we could realistically achieve encapsulating a really good picture of uh, without having to go through and, and do, you know, a ridiculous amount of stuff. Like, if we were going to even do one standard gauge railroad all the way across the U.S., like, get all their locomotives and cars, I mean, it's just a tremendous amount of work. Whereas narrow gauge, it, just being a smaller venue overall, uh, it's a little bit more achievable for us. So... Uh, that's why we did that. So the big boy is obviously not three foot narrow gauge, so it's not coming to the game. That said, uh, I'm sure that when we get around to getting Steam Workshop support and mods in, uh, folks will be modding in standard gauge, and I would not be surprised to see if a big boy comes then. That said, we do have plans for some rather large narrow gauge articulated locomotives, which are going to fit the bill of the big boy. Yes, it won't be the exact same look, but the the feeling of raw power and controlling, you know, several thousand horsepower beast of a locomotive, uh, that feeling will, will get achieved by those. So uh, here's a couple of pictures from the tech tree of prospective locomotives that are on there that kind of fit the bill. Okay, the last question as far as Q&A goes is, what about tunnels and cuts? So this is uh, obviously a really interesting and, uh, and would be a very handy tool um, and would certainly help things feel more realistic. Like I could have done a lot of cuts here instead of making this big fill, which is what the railroad would have done. However, to get that accomplished in the Unreal Engine in a way that makes sense and is able to be done real time by a player in a multiplayer game is very complex um, and would probably require us rewriting the game's base code and the geometry of all the levels using voxels or something instead of the baked in terrain that we have. Um, so I don't, I don't see them coming anytime soon. Obviously it's something that we would really, really love to have and it would be a great feature and would make the game more realistic. But um, the amount of effort that it takes to get that feature at this time um, is 
kind of significant. So uh, that's why I'm not anticipating that right now. Okay, so we've cleared to the logging camp. Uh, we're gonna lay the railroad all the way on down and uh, we're gonna see if we can't get some trains moving. Okay, I well, just got almost back to the yard and I realized one important thing that I missed on building the start here. So I didn't put in a passing track. Uh, the way that the game starts, Betsy has a flat car just in front of her. And I would prefer it to be on the other end so that I can run around and um, buy more cars and add them to the train behind her. So we're gonna build a pass track real quick. And then that way we can buy a couple more cars with our starting cash and have, you know, a bit more profit right away. So that's what we're gonna do here. And I'm trying not to directly connect the switches to what I already have, just so that they don't do anything too crazy as far as positioning, because when they snap perfectly to the rails with the way that I lay the track and things don't always uh, sit nicely. Sometimes the uh, the switches end up at a funky angle. So I try to place the switches and then lay the track to them rather than lay the switches off of my track. Oops, but I messed that one up a little bit, didn't I? That's all right. We could probably just do a short little piece like that. And it's not too big of a deal. Okay. Boom, and that's that. And we'll do one of these to reconnect that. And that's not the greatest, but that's okay. We can live with that. All right, I'm going to go get Betsy fired up, and then we'll rock and roll. Okay, Betsy's up to operating pressure. And we're ready to go. All right. So now we'll just, uh, we, we don't... I guess the only concern that we might run into now if, if I just send it at full yeet is that the, there's a chance that the switch that's at the sawmill is not lined for us, but uh, I guess we'll find out. We're gonna do some railroad in here. Go Betsy, go. All right. Probably don't need much, but get a little more wood in there. And here we go, we can fly down the railroad and I mean, Obviously, for YouTube, I've cut out some of the, the little bit of the stuff, but I mean, I've really been only at this for maybe an hour and a half tops, and I've got my train ready to run, and I'm doing it all by myself, so if you've got friends and you've got a uh, multiplayer save, it's even easier to do than what I just did, so. And it's a pretty nice-looking railroad. Obviously, we're going to have to add some sidings and yards and, and flesh things out a bit more, of course, but um, I really want to do this the right way. I mean, my last save that I've been playing on, I've... I've been playing, uh, you know, without like dev powers or dev money or anything. Um, but this one, I really want to play now that the physics has been updated. This is on the beta branch. Um, I want to do everything the right way and do it in front of you guys on camera so you guys can see, you know, how I operate my railroad, how I'm building things, how I run the trains, uh, given the correct physics and all that. I kind of like how this bit of the railroad turned out. It's kind of cool. Stick your head out the, the side of the cab. Get that good for first person view. Uh, I don't like how this transition to the bridge is. It's a little bit of a kink. But that's not even out of the, the scope of something that you'd actually see, though. So, All right, we're, we're kind of coming up on where that switch is, so we're going to have to be careful. Maybe we'll, we'll we'll get off of full yeet and uh, we'll see what it's lined as. I guess I could probably run up ahead. Nope, I run as fast as the porter. All right. No god powers here, ladies and gents. Oh, that's right. I already placed the return switch in. So actually, we've got two switches to check. And they're right around this corner. So we'll just ease it down to a, a nice crawl here and go and check those. Yeah, th this turn didn't end out that great. Um, I'm sure that I'm gonna have to do, ooh, oh, the <laughs> lordy, I didn't even lay the tracks all the way. Ah! <laughs> Pay no attention to the Wallace and Gromit. 
Okay, at least the switches <laughs> the switches are thrown the right way, but there was no track connecting some of them. It's fine. It's fine. Don't even worry about it. All right. Um, I'm going to have to do a lot more work clearing out some of this stuff, and uh, we'll fix that curve when we come to it. But uh, obviously it works. I mean, it works well enough that I could probably have full scent around it. Um, obviously, had I known my switches were lined, but, uh, you know, <laughs> they weren't in this case, so we're going to keep going. Oh, so uh, somebody was making a comment about whistle signals on one of the other videos I was looking at, and uh, the whistle signals that I use, and I, I just use the ones that I'm used to from the timetable at the Railroad Museum, which is the same as, you know, the Cumbres and Toltec, the Durango and Silverton, or, uh, you know, the old Rio Grande rule books, really. Um, and I, I've, I actually haven't done the math. It'll be really embarrassing if I can't pull these five cars up at three-quarter percent. I guess I won't even check my spreadsheet. We'll just see what happens. Um, but uh, the whistle signals, I mean, some of them are pretty standard, like, you know, two long whistles for heading forwards, uh, two short ones to say, like, okay, or, you know, while running, um, and then three short to back up. One short means stopped. Um, the big one that's helpful for multiplayer, though, uh, particularly if you're coming up to junctions or, or industries, is that there's a, a call for action or a call for what to do. Like, I'm approaching a station, so you give one long whistle. And if you have a, a conductor or a brakeman on the back of the train, you, you call, you look back, and then, you know, you'd have to be in Discord chat or something like that, and it would tell you what to do. But in real life, you'd look back and look and see if they give you a high ball or a, or a low. So they'll have their timetable sticking out up, you know, up over their head, out to the right, or that'll be down towards the track. And up means, hey, we're going to keep going, and down means we're stopping. So a really easy way to, to know what you're going to do. So, like, I'm, I'm approaching the logging camp. All right. And we'd look. And he'd say, hey, there's no more track. So he puts his hand down, and we'd say, okay, we're stopping. So we do three. And then that's acknowledged that, yeah, we're, we're stopping at the next station. We need to get MOW up here. That tree's a little close. I like how this bit of the railroad came out, too. It's a bit of a sharp curve up through here, but it, it's kind of a cool uh, turn back. It ended up being a little pretty. And I think I, I certainly could come back and, and relay this curve nice and smooth. I think this is one that would benefit from using the tool, uh, the radius locking tool, as opposed to just hand laying it, because it, it didn't come out quite as nice as the other ones. But it, it's a little bit pretty piece of railroad right there. I like that. Oh lordy, that's a bit of a that's a bit of a yoink right there. It's not too bad, but obviously it could be smoothed out. All right, here we are. So we're gonna spot this train up here and hopefully not fall off the end of the tracks because I'm forgetting that I don't have any braking power because I'm used to the locomotives with air brakes. Mm. All right, this might actually. Oh man, if it just stops, perfect. Nah, it's gonna be a little too short, so we're gonna cheese it a little bit. Alright, I'm gonna spot this up, we're gonna load up some logs, um, and then I'll, I'll be back with you shortly. Alright, we are back and fully loaded, we're gonna take this thing down the hill, and uh, I'm gonna see if we can do it with just, uh, just Betsy's handbrake, we'll see what it does. <laughs> he, can, he can feel the extra weight of the cars. Oh, poor Betsy. Yeah, these cars are pretty heavy. I want to say that a uh, fully loaded log car is something like 18,000 pounds a piece. So, times five. I mean, it's almost 100,000 pounds. Betsy itself doesn't weigh that much. Probably only weighs... What, I guess it's the eight ten, uh, eight ton border, so it's only supposed to be, like... 16,000 itself, so. Alright, the grade starts somewhere right around here, so we're gonna stop throwing the full accelerator here. And, uh, just give it some break and see what happens. Let's 
this actually kind of works her out not turning the train around. I can keep the train in tension just by using the handbrake. And it looks like we're, it's being more than effective, so we'll leave it at a lower percentage. But uh, in terms of train handling, there's a couple of different strategies trying to keep the train in tension or trying to keep it in compression. Uh, and so right now we're keeping everything in tension. All the cars are stretched out because the, the weight is on the downhill side and we're braking from the rear. Whereas if you were if we were flipped and we had the port on the front, we'd be in compression if we were just using the porter's brake. Um, which we might, you know, that might work, probably. I mean, you might want to have a little bit of extra braking with this much weight behind the cute little porter, but this works for these purposes. If you ever find yourself trying to figure out which one to use, just make sure that you're being real smooth, making changes between tension and compression. Um, that's where issues can come in, and that's where like links and couplers break uh, in real life. Is when you know you're in compression and you yank the throttle out real quick, and all of a sudden you're going to tension, and you can feel that the slack run out in each single coupler. So you get a bang, 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 running all the way back down the train, uh, which can cause a considerable stack up of force. So it's not desirable. Same thing if uh, if you're hauling people, not freight. Freight doesn't complain. Uh, if you're hauling people and you're and you're going from tension to compression, like if you're cresting over a hill where you'd been leading with your locomotive, and then uh, subsequently afterwards you needed to, you know, slow down to go down this big hill or whatever. Um, if you brake with the locomotive rather than the train, uh, those cars then run in on you, and if you grab a whole bunch of independent brake just to start with. Um, you can have all of that weight run into you at once, so you get the slam of the whole train running in on you. Whereas if you can kind of slowly gather the cars, um, slowly feather on the independent brake, uh, you have a much more successful time of it. Because then you, you basically gather the cars one at a time as gently as you can so that you don't feel the slack run in on you. And then when you do that, you, uh, you don't run that, end up knocking your conductor on his butt. Ask me how I know. <laughs> Most of these things I've learned learned by doing, and I've I've done a couple of bonehead things and watched a couple of bonehead things done. I don't I don't think I've ever actually put a conductor on on his butt uh, going downhill. I have going uphill though. I was trying to demonstrate the technique of charging the superheaters and then using the the rapid expansion of having the superheaters full of steam and. Uh, it was very effective, and we accelerated very quickly, and poor Al was not ready for it. <laughs> I also didn't realize it was going to be that effective, but I also don't think he fell over, actually, but he gave me a radio complaining about it. <laughs> so, all in good fun. Okay, well, we're almost to the log pond here, and we'll, we'll dump these off, and, and we'll get our first... Our first paycheck, and then uh, maybe buy some more cars uh, next time and run some loads to the freight depot or, or anything like that. So get some cash flow going and see uh, see how quick we can get another locomotive. Probably, um, I don't know if I want to get Eureka as a mid-step or if I want to try and go straight for the Heisler because I want the whistle. And then we could do Heist Heisler puns. Oh, lordy. That might, I might have to pull forward again. Get some of these unloaded at least. Oh, this last one might unload. I don't know. Let's try it. Looks like it. We should have uh, 30 logs all said and done. And yeah, I mean, it's already started sawing, so we got them all unloaded. All right, so this has been the first episode of watching the Railroads Online dev play Railroads Online. I'm obviously not the, the only dev, just a member of the team, but I hope you guys uh, appreciate my insight into the game and how I like to lay and run my railroad. Um, if you guys like this, please let me know below. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and uh, click the little bell icon, and please leave a comment. Let me know what you guys think and what you want to see next time. This is Mark, also known as Heiss, signing off. Take it easy, guys.